everybody, my name is Brittany Shank and I am here to present to you the Effects of Trauma Guiding Our Child Welfare Workers Part 1. This is a three-part webinar, so if you would like to see the other two pieces of it, you can go ahead and just type into YouTube the same heading and you will find Part 1 and Part 2. So I would just like to start with talking a little bit about myself and so you can get to know me a little bit. I will try to remember to do this video piece every once in a while so it can be a little more personalized and you don't get bored just kind of staring at the uh, slides. So a little bit about me. I am currently getting my master's degree from the University of North Dakota and the final piece of that is to create uh, some sort of uh, final piece after researching literature of whatever topic you've decided. And so I'm super passionate about kids and trauma and the child welfare system and so that's why I've decided to go this route of trying to help teach our child welfare workers and trying to help um, give them some understanding of trauma since a lot of our kids in the child welfare system have endured a significant amount of trauma. So this is my final piece to my master's program, and I've done tons and tons of research, and so I am just honored to share this with you guys so you guys can hear a little bit about it. So I'm finishing up my degree from UND in social work. Uh, additionally, I do work for the county social service agency in town. I'm a case manager for children in foster care. I am in the military, and I work with survivors of sexual assault. And currently I'm in my internship with an agency in town that works very dedicated uh, is, and is very dedicated, my apologies, to kids in the foster care system. And so they do a lot of therapy with the children, the birth parents, and the foster parents for those families that are in the system. So I think I have a little bit of a perspective and I am so eager to share my knowledge with you guys that I have and I can't wait to hear some of the knowledge you guys have. So this is my first webinar. I haven't done one before, so please let me know the pros and cons to it, what's good and what, what's not so great. I would love to make it better, and I would love to learn from you guys. So we will um, go ahead and get started. With this initial portion, this first piece, of the webinar. We're going to talk about the lowdown on trauma, what is trauma, where does trauma come from, and why is it that trauma affects one child versus another differently. And so we'll just start off with some um, statistics and some foundational information. Uh, during the year of 2012, there were 650,000 child victims of abuse and neglect. And additionally, in 2014, there are 412,129 children in the foster care system. So these are U.S. statistics. Uh, also with that, all of the statistics I have are from reputable sources. Their references are listed right below the statistic. And if uh, references aren't listed right underneath the information, they will be at the bottom of the slides. And full reference lists will be at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions or want to see the article or the website I got the information from, everything should be there and is provided for you. Uh, lastly, from 2013 to 2014, there was an increase in 15,000 children in the foster care system. So we're definitely not seeing a decrease in ch children in the foster care system. It's for sure increasing. So this is a, a increasing trend. It's something that we need to know about, we need to be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about, and we need to make sure that we're using cutting-edge strategies when working with these kiddos. Just some additional statistics for kids in foster care in the United States. This was from 2014. The average age of a child in foster care is 8. The average length of stay is 13.3 months. And then I also broke it down by race. So 42% of kids in foster care in 2014 were white, 24% African American, 22% Hispanic, 10% multiracial, and that last 3% is unknown or unable to be determined. So now creating the foundation of types of trauma that uh, a child can endure, we'll start with just kind of the basics. So physical abuse is any sort of intentional physical force, so hitting, kicking, shaking, burning, etc. And so I always look at physical abuse as those types of abuse that oftentimes cause marks or leave marks. Uh, so that could be, you know, hitting with your hands or it could be hitting with an object. The kicking, uh, shaking, like shaken baby syndrome, um, which obviously uh, is trauma to the brain and then burning. Going on to sexual abuse, this is engaging in 
uh, child in sexual acts. So this could be fondling, rape, exposing a child to sexual activities, things like that. And oftentimes I think when we think of sexual abuse, the only things we think of really are the fondling and the rape. I don't think that right away exposing a child to sexual activities comes to mind, but oftentimes that's where a child's watching sexual acts occur, is exposed to sexual topics uh, or sexual uh, uh, objects, things like that. And emotional abuse, behaviors that harm a child's self-worth or emotional well-being. So name-calling, shaming, rejection, withholding love, threatening, things like that. And I think with emotional abuse, that is can be really difficult in the social service world, the child protection world, because those are things that are not concrete. They, um, they're they not, uh, how can I say it? They're, it's hard to measure. It, you can't see it on a child. It's not like your physical abuse where you can see the bruise or you can, you, you can see the scar or things like that. Emotional abuse, you can't see. And then going on to neglect. So failure to meet a child's basic needs. So that's food, clothing, housing, education, medical care. And whenever I think of neglect, I always think of a lack of something. So a lack of food, a lack of shelter, uh, a lack of supervision. It's always the, the missing of something for neglect. So trauma from the child welfare system. A lot of times we think of trauma in terms of what I had just explained, the physical abuse, the emotional abuse, the neglect. But the child welfare system in itself does impose trauma on kids, whether we want it to or not, it does. And so that's a piece of this webinar that I really want to be open about and to be considering, especially because this webinar is aimed at child welfare workers. So some of the, the trauma that we see from the child welfare system begins with the removal from the home. So a child's removed from their home, they're clearly separated from their family at that time. A lot of times they're separated from their siblings. A lot of times they're removed from their school. Many times they're not in just one placement. And oftentimes we have a lack of, lack of trauma-focused foster homes. So I really would like to talk about this slide uh, a little bit more. So uh, separation from siblings is a big deal to me. And so I, I think about our kiddos and I think about their security and their feeling of safety and uh, their closeness, closeness to other people. And oftentimes siblings are closest to siblings. And I would argue that siblings are likely some of the only people that truly understand the trauma that, that the child has gone through or that each other has gone through. And there's that connection because of that. And so we can have therapists involved and we can have child welfare workers involved, but uh, Nobody is going to understand that trauma like that sibling has understood that trauma. So when we do things like remove siblings from each other, we are separating something for, from a child that is just irreplaceable and is extremely traumatizing to that child. So when we talk about removing siblings, uh, removing family and removing their home, a lot of times the only thing left for a child is their school. And so if we're, we're putting a child in, in a foster home away from their parents, away from their siblings, away from everything that they've known, and we also remove them from our school, very likely that's the last piece of safety that they have intact. And so we'll really touch on this a lot more in later discussions, but I do want to touch on this just quickly during this foundation piece. And so there's this uh, quote on the side to the right from Plotkins that says, children in foster care are two times more likely to suffer PTSD than military veterans in the US. And that um, is actually concerning combat military veterans. And that is a staggering uh, quote, that they are two times more likely to suffer PTSD than military veterans. And so I think that really shines light on the issue that we have with kids in the child welfare system and really being sensitive to the trauma that they've endured. And so the next piece that I wanna talk about is how trauma affects kids differently. And so a lot of times I'll hear or I'll see or I'll think that there are two kids from the same house that endured the same trauma but one has a, a much different story and is displaying much different behaviors than the other. And so there are reasons for that. Uh, research shows that there are reasons for that. It can be really hard to comprehend 
uh, why that's happening. And it can be really, really easy to think that one of the children is being dishonest uh, or that they're not tell or that the other child's not telling you the full story. And it's really easy to look at that situation with distrust. And so uh, most, uh, most children from even the same home are not going to look identical in terms of their trauma. And so there are many things that can play a factor in how a child views trauma or how trauma affects a child, um, which includes ongoing trauma, uh, cumulative traumatic experiences, physical and emotional availability of caregivers. So how often is there a caregiver available? If a caregiver is available more often than not, a traumatic experience may not be as traumatic for a child. Um, also, some of the biggest factors are the child's age and the level of development. And so when we're looking at preschool children, oftentimes preschool children who have endured trauma feel helpless, uncertainty, fear. They have difficulty verbalizing their feelings and emotions surrounding the trauma. Um, oftentimes these children, you'll see uh, skills that they've previously mastered go away. So they might have troubles falling asleep or staying asleep, which never previously happened. They may all of a sudden have difficulty separating from parents at school. They may have a loss of toilet, toileting skills, night terrors, and you might see less imagine, imaginative play and more repetitive play from these little kiddos. Moving on to school age kids, school age kids often show feelings of guilt, shame, and sadness. And so these kids consider their role in the trauma over and over and over again, and oftentimes will become preoccupied in really replaying this in their mind. Uh, school age children oftentimes fear for their safety and the safety of others and their family in schools. And these kids too might have difficulty falling or staying asleep. They might start having nightmares, difficulty concentrating at school. It's really difficult to concentrate on some schoolwork when at home you're wondering if mom's going to be there or dad's going to be there or if somebody went to jail or if mom and dad are fighting or if there's going to be food on the table. School is really a tiny, tiny piece of a child's life if those are the types of worries they have about home. These school age kids oftentimes will start engaging in reckless behavior or start appearing more aggressive. And so this is the time when we start seeing the suicide attempts, depression, illicit drug use, multiple sex partners. Uh, oftentimes these school age kids are the ones starting to display what we would call behaviors. and. Uh, and school age is when the physical ailments start. So you might start seeing kids uh, saying that they're starting to have migraines or they're starting to have stomach aches and wanting to go home from school or, or being seen at the doctor more often because of that. And so we'll even see kids that have stomach aches uh, from the, the trauma and the anxiety. And oftentimes these kids will actually start throwing up from uh, the trauma and anxiety and replaying it over and over and over again in their mind. And so now going into adolescents, adolescents who endured trauma oftentimes have feelings of fear, shame, and guilt. These are the kids that are really concerned about other people finding out and don't want to be labeled as abnormal. Adolescents oftentimes withdraw from family and friends and, and begin uh, sometimes to engage in self-destructive behavior. So really dependent upon where the child's at, their stage of development, and the caregiver's availability in that child's life will really, really depend upon what trauma looks like in a child. And so it's really important, like I said in the beginning of this piece of it, to not look at one child and think that they're being dishonest, or to look at another child and think that they're not telling you the full story. Because oftentimes, uh, kids will experience trauma very differently from each other based upon what we just talked about. And so uh, also, it's going to depend how long the child was in the house, and that goes back to age. So if you have a one-year-old and a five-year-old that lived in the same house, endured the same type of trauma, your five-year-old is very likely going to have uh, a different sense of what that trauma looked like compared to the one-year-old because the five-year-old was in the household for five years. The one-year-old was only there for one. And so you might see some pretty big differences between siblings and it's just so important not to think that the inconsistent statements or the inconsistent uh, perception of trauma isn't actually an inconsistency. It's actually reality uh, just based upon what we talked about. So that is uh, it for the first session of the webinar. I would appreciate any questions, comments, suggestions that you guys have sent to me at brittany.a.shank at gmail.com. 
Again, this is my first time doing these webinars, so if you have any advice, any things that went well, any things that aren't that didn't go well um, or things that aren't clear, please, please, please let me know. I want to make these uh, as inclusive as I possibly can and understandable as I possibly can. So please let me know what your comments, questions, and suggestions are. I look forward to uh, hearing from you guys and I hope that you guys are able to listen to the other two webinars because I think you will absolutely love them. Thank you so much.